Hi, I'm Danger Dan Jers, the host and GM of the D&D Real Play podcast, d and Dark. Join us on Wednesdays for an absurd, over-the-top comedy horror adventure starring some of history's most infamous monsters. I'm Ben Magnet. I play Mary Frankenstein, our barbarian. I am Daniel Cruz. I am playing Imhotep the Mummy, our cleric. I'm Jordan, and I play Larry Talbot, a lycanthropic warlock. I am Grayson, playing Jack Griffin, the Invisible Man, the party's rogue. I am Aaron. I play the Phantom of the Opera, our bard. For more information, go to dndarkpodcast.com and listen to us anywhere you find podcasts. Hey, everybody, this is Davis with Con Freaks and Geeks, and I would like to welcome you to another episode of Pop Culture Gems. This is a series where we talk to amazing creators, artists, cosplayers, voice actors, and so much more. Uh, if you like the interviews we do uh, with these amazing guests, give us a thumbs up or subscribe to our YouTube channel, the CFG channel, or you can listen to it on any podcast services that are currently out there. Uh, if you want to check out all the fantastic geeky content in one area, you can always check out our main website, confreaksandgeeks.com for the whole package we as a country is coming back uh to a sense of no- normalcy finally after being stuck in our homes for a year uh people are going back to the office no more slackless zoom calls but the most important thing is con season is coming back <laughs> so that's why i am excited to talk to my next guest who runs an incredible convention that is coming in december called la comic con has been around for almost a decade i uh who better to explain the hype of a comic convention than the ceo and director of a con itself i would like to welcome chris demolin to the show how are you doing sir i am terrific davis thank you for having me i'm excited to be here <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome well let's just Again, a, a, a good uh, explanation. Like, what is LA Comic Con? What is LA Comic Con? Well, LA Comic Con um, started life in 2011 as a little show called um, Kamikaze Expo. And it was, I, I love the story about it because it was started by um, two brothers and a sister who were so frustrated that they hadn't gotten into a larger convention you may have heard of that happens in San Diego every year for a couple of years in a row. And they just said, we're going to start our own convention. And so the idea has always been sort of it's a by, it's very much a by fans for fans convention um, that reflects the unique sort of pop culture mashup that is Los Angeles. And so we try to represent the entire spectrum of, of fun, geeky, nerdy, pop culture, science fiction, uh, music things going on in L.A. and bring it all together once a year for three days and invite everybody to come enjoy it. I did not know that story. I, so essentially, one could say that 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 con was the LA Comic Con was made in spite <laughs> for uh, uh, for not coming to San Diego. You know, I I, I love all conventions. San Diego is a terrific <laughs> convention, but you know there are. It is true that sometimes that you're frustrated, you can't get tickets, you can't get in. And so what I loved was the ingenuity of the of the founders who just said, if we can't get into that one, we'll make one of our own. And, and frankly, they, they did an amazing thing because in 2011, at a first-time convention, um, they got both Stan Lee and Elvira, the Mistress of the Dark, to agree to come and be guests. Um, Stan eventually ended up becoming one of our business partners. We, we licensed his name. It was Stan Lee's uh, Kamikaze and Stan Lee's LA Comic Con for a while. So they, they did a great thing. And they started, you know, LA should have its own convention. Um, we deserve to have a hometown con. And so, uh, you know, we're excited that they did that. And, Last year would have been our 10th anniversary, so I'm not quite sure if this is our 10th anniversary or our 11th anniversary, but I I sort of think of it as like Spinal Tap. You know, we're just, we're we're one more. We're going to go to 11. (laughs) <laughs> that's a good way. Of, that's a good way of describing that. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I was actually thinking about it the other day. I was like, yeah, it's surprising that LA Comic Con is really the only comic convention that is like the big event that's in LA. And you would think since the size of LA is ginormous, you would think that this would have been something that would have been hap- that would have happened a long time ago. But I'm really glad that y'all are are there. Yeah, I think others started conventions. You know, there were other companies that were came from out of town and tried to start conventions. I think one of the reasons why we've been successful is that we're all Angelinos and we're all fans. And so Mm -hmm. it really is a a fan first convention and, you know, by fans for fans and what would Angelinos want to see there are the two things that sort of guide everything we do in terms of the guests we bring in and how we set the layout and all the rest of it. I think being, being a fan based LA based convention has allowed us to be successful and the fans have been, you know, amazing. They've embraced us and, 
more of them come every year, which is exciting. Perfect. That's awesome. And I mean, just like you're saying, uh, everyone's a fan. I know you're 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 definitely a fan of what you do. I mean, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be doing it still uh, after ten years of doing it. But like, what is your personal fandom? Like, what would you consider? Are you oh. more into the comic side, anime, sci-fi? Like, what sure. would you say? I mean, my personally, it's sort of different parts of my life, different things. Right? As a kid, I was a huge comic collector. Um, I was a Marvel collector. I was specifically an Avengers collector. Um, and you know, I've told this story that when I was in college, um, I, I ran out of money. I couldn't pay my tuition. And at the time I owned a complete set of every Avengers comic that had ever been released, including annuals and giant size and special editions. And I sold it to, to make enough money to pay tuition. And it's, you know, killed me, but you know, then fast forward 40 years of my life and I'm working with Stan Lee in a professional capacity at LA comic con. So, you know, it led to something good. Um, I'm a big fantasy fan as well. Um, you know, I was a uh, big Lord of the Rings. I was really fortunate. Part of my life, I worked in the movie business. I worked on creating the, the Narnia movies about 15 years ago, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which was amazing. Um, I'm also a sci-fi guy. You know, I, I was uh, opening weekend at Star Wars in, in 1977. So I, I'm kind of a nerd through and through. I appreciate a lot of different things. That is awesome. It's really good when you, you're 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 an aged nerd. <laughs> That's what comes yeah. into. Well, <laughs> yeah, you know, David, and it's funny you say that because um, yeah, I have kids now and they're in their twenties. But when they were little, um, I just I I discovered all these new things. Like I'm a huge SpongeBob fan because I spent years, you know, with my kids on either side of me on the couch watching those fantastic Nickelodeon cartoons. I just think I, I'm I love pop culture, and at different stages of my life, I I've learned been exposed to and learned to appreciate so many different things and. And I think it's been a gift for all of us the way, you know, Marvel has kind of opened up nerddom to the masses over the last 10 years. And, and uh, you know, now you can say you're a nerd and, and be proud and loud about it. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Definitely agree with that. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I was taking a look on your uh, on the website, which, by the way, folks, if you ever want to check out, go to their website. It's LAComicCon.com, right? Or it's uh, ComicConLA.com. Sorry about that. Yeah, ComicConLA.com. And uh, they already have this, like a list of guests that are currently out there. And uh, and we're only in June uh, doing, the, doing the podcast for this episode. And it's already shaping up to be as big as ever with the guests that we'll be attending. And it's only going to grow. I mean, <laughs> there's going to be more and more uh, announcements here in the future. Right, right. And uh, how do you, I, I was kind of wondering, like, how do you determine the guests uh, that you are bringing out to the show? Sure. Um, well, every year we do, um, we have a big following on social media. We probably have 200, 250,000 people that we interact with all the time on our social media. Um, and, uh, and we also have a big database of emails. So we regularly pull the fans and we say, who are your favorites in these different genres? Who would you like to see? And, and we're really driven by that. I mean, in 2019, um, a couple of the things that popped up were, um, people love the office. People loved, um, SpongeBob. So we went out and we got a bunch of the cast from the office. We got some of the voice cast from SpongeBob to come to the show for the first time. So we, we do that. And we also like to have um, sort of classic nostalgia guests. And then we like to have people from things that are brand new and fresh. And, and uh, you know, having a guest like uh, Giancarlo Esposito, who's right now in both, you know, Mandalorian and The Boys, which are two very cool, very different things that are out there in our world. Um, it feels very current to us. So we try to have a whole mix, but a lot of it is from surveying the fans and ask who they'd like to meet and who they'd like to see. Oh, okay. That, well, that, that's cool. Makes, it makes sense. Uh, and uh, what sets LA Comic Con apart from other events and other cons out there? Um, I think there's a couple of things. I, I think being fan driven um, and being in LA. So being in LA, LA is such an eclectic town, right? For pop culture and for, um, for entertainment. And so we have a very eclectic mix of guests. And one of the things I like to say is that no matter what you're a fan of, I think if you come to LA Comic Con, you'll find something that fits your fandom. And I think that, you know, for me, that that process of walking down an aisle and you turn a corner and you you run into something that's just, it's either from your childhood or it's, excuse me, um, i turn my phone off. And, uh, or, or it's just, you, you see something you've never done before. So I think that range, that eclecticism is, is very LA. Um, and I also think, you know, like one of the things we do is we put our main stage right in the middle of the main hall. I don't like that thing where the main stage is someplace else and you have to leave the building, you have to leave the show, you have to go, you know, wait in line for hours for something else. 
it's right there. And so I think what that does as a fan, it, it, it makes your whole day's experience better. You're shopping, you're waiting in line for an autograph, then you, you hear there's something on the main stage, you can walk right over and see that, go right back to what you were doing. I think that accessibility is very much of an LA thing. And the, the layout of our convention center really helps us do that to have everything in close proximity. So, yeah, I was actually wondering about that because I I, I remember, I, I don't know what year it was, but I did go to LA Comic Con. I believe it was the year after it was officially changed to LA Comic Con. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and uh, I was like, wow, this is actually, uh, this was a surprisingly good, this is a good idea because I never really thought that they would have their main, the main stage to be like the second you get into the LA Convention Center, it's like right there in your face, you know. Uh, right. uh, in the main in the main foyer. So. Like before I worked, I worked in the trade show industry for a long time, and I I think that that sense when you're a, a fan or you walk into a show and there's this huge red carpet that takes you up to the stage, and that's where all the marquee stuff's going to be. But then you mm. look around and you can see the signs, and you can just easily navigate and figure out, oh, the horror stuff's over there, the comics are over here, the collectibles are over here. It, it puts the power in the hands of the fan to figure out where they want to go and how they want to shop through their day. And I think that that, you know, the, the, the way you lay out a show so that it's super easy to shop and get around, I think is very important. I think like the way, yeah, I, I'm kind of wondering about like how traffic flow would be with that, with something like that. Cause I mean, you say the main stage is there and you have like, like, I mean, some of your people like Zachary Levi or I mean, yep. Frank Miller and stuff like that coming up in the front like that. And just to still have steady traffic is one of the most annoying things that I've had, uh, I've experienced, especially at this, at LA convention center. And I'm not going to name any conventions, but like <laughs> is how they, uh, how they funnel you up the because uh, you remember there's like the two escalators that are yeah. uh, that goes up to the exhibitor hall how they funnel you to just those two escalators and then you just see a sea of people right. filtering out just trying to get in and it's like man i really wish there was a better way but y'all did the, y'all did an excellent job on that well thank you i mean i think you know one of the challenges of any convention when you have you know on a saturday we last year on in 2019 on saturday we had over sixty thousand people in the building So you have to have, you have to think through that. You have to have enough entrances. And frankly, we didn't have enough entrances in 2019. People had to wait in line for an hour, an hour and a half sometimes to get in, which is totally unacceptable. And so, you know, we've tripled the number of entrances in 2021 because we want the fans to come and and they should immediately be able to get right into the middle of the experience. And so, um, you know, I think on that entrance, you have to do that. Use the escalators, use the stairs, let people come up and enter from both of the back entrances so that people can get on the floor because that's where the experience happens. And, you know, we got to, we got to make it as easy as possible to get into that. Right. Most definitely. And I really appreciate it because yeah, you don't want people to be staying in lines for long periods of time at no. the event for three days. Uh, and, uh, how, and, uh, did I ask? Oh yeah, I did. Uh, uh, and uh, cons are coming back uh, from an unconventional year due to the obvious reasons that we're experiencing. Um, what steps like are uh, are being made for con goers to feel safe attending LA Comic Con in sure. like mass crowds in the end of this year? Sure, I, I mean some specifics we know, and some things they'll develop. We you know we developed last year because we we were trying to have a convention in December last year, um, and so we were working really closely with the LA Department of Public Health. Um, on all of those sorts of guidelines, and that will carry forward into this year. Uh, but some of the things that we decided, so we're doubling the space. In the past, we've only been in the South Hall. We're not taking the West Hall. We're going to be across the entire convention center. So we'll be spread out over over 1.2 million square feet of space. So whatever the density guidelines are, that will help. Um, and then I think at that point in time, you know, probably September, October, we'll be working with them to figure out, are we still doing temperature checks? Are we still doing masks? Um, you know, we've, we've tripled the amount of cleaning that's going on to make sure that every couple of hours we're cleaning things. So we'll, we will be, whatever the sort of CDC and LA Department of Public Health guidelines are, we'll be at that or a little bit more. Um, we just don't know exactly what the specifics are and we won't know till we get a little bit closer, but, um, you know, we're prepared to do whatever it takes to make as many people who, who physically come feel comfortable that it's a safe environment. I think the other answer to your question is, is, is about digital. It's like, we're going to have the main stage, the top four panel rooms are all going to be live streamed throughout the weekend. So for people that don't yet feel comfortable being in a large crowd, we're going to make it much easier for them to get digital access to the content. Um, we had what we call them our microcon in April, where we tested some of this stuff with uh, digital panels, digital guests, digital meet and greets, digital signatures. Um, so we're working all that stuff out so that the, the show in December We'll have all of those components live, but all of those components 
will also be duplicated electronically up to and including we created an online mall called the Superfan Mall with a we worked with a video game company to to, uh, to create a navigable mall where you can walk through and find the stores and we're trying to get all the vendors so that they'll be in the digital mall as well. So I think I think all conventions have to do that. I think you have to have the safest possible live experience and then you have to offer all of the, the experiences that you have in a digital component as well for the people that don't yet feel safe coming out. That's like, yeah, I didn't even really think about still doing digital towards uh, uh, towards this event. Uh, is the uh, like with the digital on the digital side? Is this something that you'd see as a short term something that that's going to be because of what we're experiencing, or is this something that you could see that will be now you know a th- a common like you know uh, accommodation that you'll see in the future uh, for future right. future events? I mean, events? for me personally, for us, I think um, I think it should become the norm, right? I think. Um, you know, not all, not all people want to be at a convention all day long, but there might be something in the morning you really want to see. Well, so if you buy a ticket in the afternoon, you should be able to go online, watch the thing you wanted to see in the morning live on your on your computer from home, and then come in and experience it in the afternoon. Um, and the other thing we've learned uh, through all of this digital Zoom stuff is um, no matter where you are, you can still participate in things. And so I, I would love to see more uh, fans from all over the country being able to participate in LA Comic Con digitally, um, you know, most conventions are fairly local in their nature of the people who come, but there's no reason why fans all over the world can't tune in and watch, digitally watch what's going on or, you know, have a, have a personal meet and greet with, a, with a, some talent that they really love. So I, I just think the whole seamless integration of live and hybrid or live and digital hybrid is, uh, is really where everybody should go and, and let the fans decide how they want to consume the experience. Yeah, that, yeah, like you were saying, though, I think like the and like you were saying earlier, like like the reach, it's going to increase your reach by quite dramatically than making it just a local event. So I definitely would agree on that, man. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, hey, if all right. 60 million people can watch the Super Bowl, you know, how fun would it be to have 100,000 fans watching what's going on at LA Comic Con from home and per- being able to participate in the same thing that that you're participating in if you're standing on the floor? That is very, very true. Very true. All right. And uh, I mean, and being the director of uh, uh, of a fast growing convention, because I mean, I'm assuming I mean, LA Comic Con seems like it's growing every year. I mean, every time it's we, been. We've been uh, very fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like uh, what is one of the most like difficult tasks to overcome running this event? You know, there's a couple of things. I think you have to be really um, diligent about thinking through the implications of how many people are going to be there. So, you know, in 2019, our total attendance was about 123,000 people. And you really need to break that down and think about how many entrances, how many people can get through the entrance in a minute. You know, if it's if you want people to wait in line, more, not more than 20 minutes, how do you do that? So it's a lot of that sort of logistic stuff on, on the one hand. And on the other hand, you, it's, you want it to be a magical experience. So you're trying to figure out, who are the talent that people are going to go, wow, oh my goodness, I, I never thought I'd get a chance to see that person. I want to come do that. Um, how do we how do we bring them together? How do we create an experience on the floor so that, you know, I want to make sure that, it, that over 95% of the people who come when they leave go, that was amazing. I, I'm gonna, not only am I going to come back next year, I'm going to tell my friends about this. And um, so it just, it takes a year's worth of planning. And, you know, you go into this, we get the convention center two days before we open. It's just a big empty box. The whole thing has to get set up in 48 hours. We then welcome 120,000 people over the course of three days. They leave and 36 hours later, it's an empty box again. But it takes mm. a year's worth of planning to make that go smoothly. And, uh, you know, and that's part of the fun of it. It's, uh, it's a little magical. Fortunately, there's this thing in the trade show business. They're called trade show elves. Um, that they seem to come in the middle of the night and somehow help you so that no matter how crazy things are 12 hours before you open, you're always ready to open on time. <laughs> <laughs> that is, yeah that is a that is a miracle definitely definitely so i mean i'm assuming like crunch time especially organization and uh also outside sources like you know yeah. vendors and stuff coming in just like it has to be like a well-oiled machine to get all that going correctly so, absolutely ugh. and we, i mean we have an amazing staff we're a small team our whole team is only eight or nine people um but by the time we're we're getting ready to set the show up we have probably 300 helping us. We have general contractors, we have registration vendors, we have all these people that come together and it, it becomes like a giant symphony orchestra and you're, you're standing up front there conducting and, and, uh, 
you know, my team is just, they're amazing. They have, you know, years and years of experience of doing this and they're all themselves huge fans. And so they just love the process of bringing it to life. Wow. Yeah. That, that's all. That's great. Uh, and, uh, uh, and also, like, I mean, as, as a director in the same position, like, how hard is it to balance the amount of events to provide representation of all the different type of geeky fandoms? Because, I mean, there's I mean, there's a lot. I mean, there's Whovians, sure. Star Wars, Star Trek. I mean, all that yeah. you're trying to put all in one event in three days. Like, how is that possible? for, <laughs> for Well, it, this is probably not really possible. But um, <laughs> I think how we try to do it is um, – we, we had, in addition to the main stage, so if you think we have a main stage that's open for, I don't know, 28 or 30 hours, and the, you, most of those presentations are half an hour. So we'll get 50 things up on the main stage. Um, but we have all these panel rooms all over the convention center where we'll do another two to 300 panels there. And so we solicit the fans a few months before the show to pitch us ideas for panels, to come in and do things. And in that process, we really try very hard to make sure that we get – as broader representation of the different genres. Um, you know, when we're looking at exhibitors to come on the floor, we always want to make sure we have some anime, we have some horror, we have a lot of comics, we have toys, we have collectibles, we have, you know, all of the different, you know, elements, fantasy and sci-fi, et cetera. Um, and gaming, gaming has become a huge part of it. And I'd like to see, you know, I think we'll do a lot more with gaming going forward, even getting into some, you know, esports stuff. Um, mm. And uh, so I think you just have to keep your pulse, your finger on the pulse of what's going on in pop culture. And then, Make space, make room for it, right? Invite people to come. Invite somebody who knows about it to come and do a panel um, and teach other people about it, or come and do an exhibition of some sort. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sure we miss some stuff, but um, I think also we, you know, try to be very make sure that we across the whole LGBTQ spectrum, make sure that that's fully represented. That you know, everybody who has a story to tell has has equal access to come and and get on one of our stages and get a spotlight and tell their story. So. Um, you know, we we're pretty conscious about trying to make sure that happens. Okay, cool. Uh, I, you know, I just thought about this. Well, just uh, in the top of my head, though, I mean, you've been like I said, you've been doing this for about for ten years uh, now, right? Uh, like, is there any moments that you would say that like that that kind of sticks into you during that time, like or what, like a memorable moment that you would say that you that you would like to share that you would share? <laughs> like, I, you know, there were a couple of things. I think. Um, and they both involve Stan Lee because, I, as I said earlier, I was a huge Stan Lee fan. 2012 or 13, Todd McFarlane came to the show, and Todd and Stan were on the stage together. And that's all it was. It was just Todd and Stan. They were going to talk to each other for half an hour. And within a couple of minutes, the, you know, the word went out among the convention that they were there. And the 12,000 people came, and they just it was ring after ring after ring of people – just stood there wrapped listening to them talk and interview each other. And, um, you know, we always design that stage to have room for about 3000 people right in front of it, but then that there's plenty of room that more people can come and stand and watch, but to be behind Stan and Todd on the stage and look out and see 12,000 faces watching them was amazing. Um, wow. and the other one was uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Stan was going to come to the show, but he wasn't well and he couldn't come. And Kevin Smith, um, who's a, you know been to the show many times? We asked him if he would. He recorded a video, and we basically got the crowd to come to the stage um, and say, um, "We love you, Stan Excelsior." Um, you know, we hope to see you soon. And we had, and he did it three times: Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we had five, six, seven thousand people each time. And we edited that together, and we're able to get it to Stan. Um, and it just is a way of saying how much we loved and appreciated him. And, you know, he passed away not long after that. And, and um, for me, watching those fans do that, they totally got it. And, and knowing how those lives that he had affected so deeply and that we were, we were able to sort of create a way for them to say thank you to him um, was just super meaningful. And I think that's, for me, that's what I love about the show is it, it's, it is all about fandom and fandom is all about what you love and what you value and community, you know, people who value the same thing coming together and sharing that love with each other. And to me, that's what comic conventions are. I mean, we're just, we're a way for the community to come together and, and celebrate the joy of what they love together. And, and so that's why we do what we do. 
Yeah, that's really that's really good. I mean, and yeah, Stanley. It's always nice to hear a good Stanley story, though. So. <laughs> there are so many, and he uh, himself like, was such a great storyteller. That dude was like, it's like he was he was so fast on his like like fast on the quip, man. Like it, it was it's really crazy because I mean, a long time ago we got a chance. I got a chance to interview him, and I was surprised, and I was already intimidated as it was, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, and I was kind of worried. But no, the but he is so he was like so fast on like you know simple like the kind of sassiness but at the same yep. time it's like he's just that playfulness i yeah that's one thing i will definitely miss about him but yeah, but yeah he was but, uh i mean and and so warm and so genuine and so caring and i think the first time i met him um the company i worked for at the time had just acquired half of of stan lee's kamikaze and, and he came in sort of like who are you and you know why should you be allowed to work on my show and uh you know, when the when the meeting was said and done, he sort of patted me on the head, hand. He says, "You'll be okay." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so, yeah, it's really it's such it's so cool. It's sort of, it was a good honor, man. It's so great. Amazing. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, and it's not fair for me to ask like, what is your favorite event during the convention, due to the vast the vast amount of of like different kinds of shows and stuff that LA Comic Con provides. My, my also, favorite events are the ones that go off without a hitch. Um, <laughs> it's like the one that you'll have to put put in your 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 focus during the event. Those are your favorite events. Right. Yeah, but, I will. You know, but, I, I will say like at the show in 2019, um, I did. Um, my daughter came to the show, um, and we stood we stood sort of in the wings backstage when Tom Kenny um, and Bill Fagerbakey were on talking about SpongeBob, and and she said hello to him as he went off, and like those kind of things where I think. Uh, I, I love entertainment that's become generational where maybe we, you enjoyed it as a kid and now you get to share that with your, your kids. And, and this was something I shared with my kids when they were four or five. And then here she is at 22 coming back. And um, that, to me, that's the wonderful thing about entertainment like that is that it, it brings us together and it bridges those generations and, and just reminds us of those simple times where, where somebody told a story and we were amazed by it. Right. Yeah, that's that's very true. Yeah, that's true. That, that's great. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, oh, wow. I didn't even finish the, the question here. But this year's event like was uh, going to be held in the Dece- in the beginning of December itself. Um, yep. I mean, this is like about two months what it normally is around for for uh, for Kamikaze usually itself. Yep. I mean, uh, it like. I don't know like what to expect on how late this event, th- this convention is going to be at so late in the year though. Like, but like, uh, I just wondering like, is like, was there a, like a reason why it was pushed sure. forward this badly or was it like, uh, no days. That's a great question. <laughs> you know, imagine during 2020, right? No events happen. And so there are hundreds and hundreds of events that didn't happen. And then we get into 2021 and it's pretty clear that between September and December, we're going to be able to have some events. So there's hundreds of events trying to get 60 slots <laughs> in convention centers <laughs> to have their events. Um, and so we were really happy that we were able to work with the LA convention center. They're an amazing partner um, and secure a date that was um, late enough in 2021 that we felt like, you know, vaccinations and everything else will be well into the, the place where people will feel comfortable coming out and event we also really didn't want to interfere with any of the holidays because we just felt people have been, you know, cooped up so long And this in 2021 at the holidays, they're going to, if they can travel again, they're going to want to go see their families on the holidays. So we wanted to be later in the year and we wanted to stay away from the holidays. And so when this first weekend in December came up, we just jumped on it. And, um, and uh, I don't know that we'll stay there next year. We're, we're still working on where we're going to be next year. As you said, historically, we were always right around, um, uh, Halloween, you know, from mid October to early November, that's a great place to be. Um, I think the fans will tell us, you know, if they come out to this date and they like this date. Um, but I think, you know, that I think anywhere between the middle of middle of uh, October and the first week of December, so that you're in the fourth quarter. Um, you know, it's it's pre pre holiday, so you can buy gifts for all your nerd friends. It's a I always think of our show as Nerd Black Friday, right? You can come and you can find all the things you want to, you know, gifts you want to buy for your nerd friends. I, I think the date will be good. And, um, but I think, um, you know, I, I think you saw a lot of people scrambling for dates at the end of the year. And I think most people will, if you look at 2022, most of us will probably go to whatever our kind of traditional dates were. 
Yeah, that's yeah. I'm hoping so because like uh, I've already gotten the list of stuff that's going to be happening on the back end of this year and then and the beginning of like January and February, and I am surprised how heavy most yeah. event, events have been pushed over because of the uh, because of the pandemic uh, right. that, it, that that it's right there and it's like so it's going to be like a, and then when the, I believe there was an article saying that like San Diego was wanting to do a live event the weekend like basically black friday weekend and i was like that is insane <laughs> to even to, to even do Davies, i'm gonna be yeah. i'm gonna be very politic and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna comment on that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah i'm not trying to yeah we won't go into there but still but uh but and uh uh, also, let's go into uh, now, like uh, like I said, you've been here for a bit. Is there any like is there a dream guest that you still haven't gotten or acquired yet for this event yet or it's uh, someone out there? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll say in a, in a larger sense, my my real dream is that um, that, you know, we're in L.A. and we're all about L.A. And so many of the con- the great big content creators are in L.A. Um, and um I would love if, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, a Marvel or a, a Netflix or, you know, Warner Brothers sort of just embraced the idea that we're the hometown con and we're going to have 125,000 fans here and they come and do whatever they want. Right. I mean, if they, it's all about what the fans want to interact with. And we've got over a million square feet of space. So I would love to see you know, one or more of the low, the big lo- local content folks um, really embrace us and say, and say, Hey, we, we want to do five or six things with you. Instead of us going and pitching them. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? But just look at us as being a resource, right? We're, we're a resource for all of the content creators in LA that they know that we're going to bring together, you know, 125,000 plus dedicated super fans and anything that they want to share with them, they can come talk to us and we'll find a way to do it for them. Um, mm. So that's on a big level. I think on a little level, every year we, we get more. I mean, one of the people we worked with on our microcon in April uh, was Sideshow, the amazing collectible company. And, you know, they're here in LA. They typically do San Diego and New York. Um, they partnered with us to be the sponsor of that microcon. Um, I, and it's, I, I love the fact that, that we can partner with somebody like that locally and, and create an opportunity for the fans to see their stuff. Um, so I think it's just, you'll see more and more of that. Um, and, um, and I, I gotta say on the flip side, one of my favorite things about our show is that we have 300 artists or so, and you may not know that artist's name, but you probably know their work. Um, and, and I think part of the fun of coming to our show is we have a larger artist alley than most shows. And that, 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 this, the, the joy of discovery of finding new artists and finding new things um, for me is a big part of why I enjoy going to conventions. And so, um, you know, some of the guests that I really want to come are ones I haven't even met yet, but I, I want the person who's, who's doing the most interesting cutting edge thing to reach out and, and, you know, we, even with struggling artists, we'll give a lot of those tables away for free. You know, we work through the comic book stores to figure out who are the artists that they know. Um, Cause we just want the fans to have access to them. Um, so, um, I, you know, I try not to, uh, uh, I, I think all of the talent at some level is equal. Cause at the end of the day, it's not important what I think it's important that all that talent that comes, there's somebody in the audience that loves them and they're going to make that connection. And so I want to, you know, I just want space for all of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. Uh, I didn't even really think about it the way that you were thinking about it. I mean, in large scale scope of scale of like, because you're literally the back door of the movie of, of movie the, the movie industry there, and I didn't even think that they would that that they would not. I mean, yeah, that would be that would be like a perfect partnership, right? Marvel yeah. and DC. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, and 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 you know, if if any of you are listening, give me a call because I would love to have you have, come and have space. And it's not like I blame them in any way. I mean, I think mm-hmm. one of the things I tell people who come to the con for the first time is is focus on the fans and the interaction you want to have. Don't come spend half a million dollars or a million dollars. And then it just becomes this big item on your budget, right? Just come and interact, come and do something that will delight the fans. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we'll help you do it as inexpensively as possible. And we're not charging those guys big fees. We just want the content there for the fans. We want the fans there for the content. 
And we're, we're sort of the catalyst to bring those two things together and to, to provide the, the opportunity um, for them to get together and mix and mingle. So, um, but yeah, I think having a hometown con, the hometown company should use the hometown con. That's, that's what I think. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I'm pretty sure you know, that I, I really feel like that's a that's a very obtainable dream that you, I mean possibility that that it's go, that LA Comic Con's going with the way the way it's going up. I'm, I mean, I won't be surprised. It'll be soon. <laughs> well, yeah, I, and I think it's a big step for us this year to expand to the whole convention center because really setting COVID restrictions aside for a little bit because I expect that will be for this year. But by 2022 or 2023, that we have room to have 200 to 250 thousand fans coming through over the course of a weekend, using the whole facility, spilling over into LA Live, you know, using using those facilities. LA is an amazing city. And that whole downtown area between the, the entire convention center um, and LA Live right next to it, it's one of the premier entertainment destinations in the world. And, um, you know, we, we, we want to we be a celebration that all of LA can be part of. Um, and LA can just kind of get their nerd on for three days or four days every year and Come and enjoy. Do y'all consider, uh, is LA Comic Con still kind of considered to be like a local event or is this more like, is it starting to kind of grow to be like people coming from out of the States from like, you know, East yeah, Coast? It's, to a, great, it's a great years. question. I, I think size wise, we're probably one of the five or six largest shows in the country at this point. And our goal has always been, because I don't think cons compete with each other. I, I think they're very, they're very local to where they are. And really, I think New York and San Diego are probably the only two cons in the country that a meaningful number of people travel to, to go see them. All the rest of them, you know, nine, more than 90% of your attendees come from within 75 miles. So right. my goal has always been that when people anywhere in America think about comic cons, they think, Oh yeah, there's San Diego, New York, and LA. And then there's a bunch of other ones too. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I would just love us to be in that top three consideration set. And we work real hard to put a con together that, that will eventually get us there. Great. Well, hey, Chris, thank you so much for stopping by uh, on this. This is awesome information that you gave me. It's really cool geeking out with you a little bit, too, <laughs> uh, here. But just to let uh, folks know, though, too, uh, starting today, we're, this is June 11th when we did the uh, this episode. Currently, you are, if you're able to go to uh, Comic-Con uh, Comic LA's website, or Comic-Con LA.com, so a website you, and register for tickets. They're doing an early bird, uh, early bird package right now. That's twenty percent off for a limited time. So definitely check out, check their stuff out. Uh, join this event. This event is fun. You you will you will not be disappointed. It is a really cool experience that I think people need to try at least once. So so hey, can uh, I just uh, say a shout out for you, Davies? I just want to thank you for doing what you do. You know, we nerds have not been able to get together in person for quite a while now. And it's people like you doing what you do that have helped hold our community together and really give us a way to, to share what we love. And so I just want to thank you for, for being there for us and providing a way for us to nerd out together. Oh, thank you. I really do appreciate it. It's actually kind of funny when I think about it, because like I was telling my friends, it's like how you how you have to adjust during the times. I was like. We, I was starving for conventions like we usually do because we go to all over the place throughout the U.S. And I was like, let's do a podcast so we can talk to folks, let's talk to talk to the people that we would talk to at conventions and see how this is going to go. And people are liking it. So but no, but it's cool. But cool guests like you will make or is always welcome to come in and talk and uh, promote, promote whatever. Well, thank you, my friend. It was a pleasure to be here. All right. Hey, guys. Well, thank you for start listening uh, to Pop Culture Gems. Uh, uh, Gems. This We will be back at another time. But the, as always, if you'd like what you hear, definitely give us a thumbs up, a like, a comment, what have you on our uh, YouTube channel, the CFG channel, or be uh, listen to uh, uh, listen to this episode on any podcast services out there. So once again, this is Davis signing off. Y'all have a great day. <laughs>